I couldn't sleep. The night before, I had spent tossing and turning, panic attack after panic attack, as impending doom crept upon me. And now I sat, staring at two judges who were looking at me, judging me. And as I sat there, I listened to the voice of someone I considered a brother, someone who had taken a piece of me, someone who had killed a part of me, and someone who was robbing me of my dignity, again, calling me a liar. In that moment, I felt like it was the worst day of my life. Now, the more I talk about my story, the more I realize that I'm not alone. And that all of us at one point in our lives will deal with some sort of trauma, be it loss, depression, addiction. The World Health Organization estimates that one in three women worldwide will experience sexual assault or physical violence in her lifetime. 300 million of us every year are suffering from depression, and 800,000 of us will commit suicide this year. We're in a lot of pain. But why? Now, for me, it took me a long time to realize that I could not hide from my pain, that I couldn't suppress it any longer. And it took years of frustration and anger and therapy and healing to finally get to this point where I could even seek justice in a courtroom. And yes, it felt like the worst day of my life as old memories washed over me, wounds were reopened, but my only saving grace <laughs> was that the next day I would be traveling to Sumatra. So as someone who loves biodiversity, wildlife, and jungles, going to Sumatra was a dream of mine. I had always dreamt of working with orangutans, and here I was documenting an organization that worked in conservation. Sumatra is one of 13,000 islands in the world's largest archipelago, making up the country of Indonesia. It's also one of the world's most important biodiversity hotspots. It's the only place in the world where the Sumatran orangutan, elephant, tiger, and rhino all live together in the same place. But all four of these creatures are critically endangered due to deforestation. Palm oil plantations have penetrated deep into the Sumatran landscape, often overtaking old-growth forests illegally and without consent from the local villagers. Palm oil has destroyed more than half of Sumatra's rainforest in just the last 30 years. That's my lifetime. And if you can imagine, one football field is the size of a hectare, and there are over six million hectares of these trees all over Sumatra. But the world's forests are responsible for taking in at least a third of our carbon emissions every year. That's 2.4 billion tons of carbon. And they act as carbon sinks. So when we cut them down, we're also releasing tons of carbon into the atmosphere. It's a big problem. And thanks to an overarching narrative of consumerism, forests aren't the only things vanishing. Wildlife are being poached for their tusks and fur and teeth. Toxins are leaching into our groundwaters, lakes and streams. Global climate is changing, and we have climate refugees to deal with. Developing countries bear the brunt of our manufacturing so that we don't have to see smog, but they can't see the sun, and they walk around with hospital masks in different colors and designs just to ease the pain of breathing. In British Columbia, there's even a company that's now bottling fresh air. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that at any point now, we should expect the Lorax to be paying us a visit. But despite the the disaster that palm oil is creating, it's also created many jobs for local people. And it's stabilized the Indonesian economy that's come out of very rough times. And the world's thirst for palm oil is so great that palm oil can be found in almost every packaged product available. It's a big issue. But the first person I met in Sumatra, his name is Penut Hedizizwoyo. And if you Google his name, you'll find that he's a National Geographic Explorer. He's also featured on the BBC and he runs an organization called the Orangutan Information Center, or OIC for short. Panut comes from very humble beginnings, growing up in a very small village. And when he came face to an orangutan with the, for the first time, it was then that he realized what his true calling was, and he wanted to help their cause. So he worked hard, going from his tiny village to earning a place, a scholarship at Oxford University. And while he was at Oxford, while his friends were out at the pub or having fun, Panut could be found cleaning toilets and bathrooms as a cleaner, just so he could earn enough money to start his organization when he got back to Sumatra. <clears throat> and so since then, 
Penute's organization has grown to include over 65 staff, and their mission is to ensure the survival of the critically endangered Sumatran orangutan. Orangutan means person of the forest. These amazing creatures, they share 97% of our DNA. They're some of the most incredible, incredibly intelligent creatures on this planet. These animals can use tools in their day-to-day, -day, and they also can understand sign language. They're also the only tree-dwelling or arboreal of the great apes, which means that they need trees to survive. And so it's no surprise that the decline in the orangutan population matches that of the deforestation rate in Sumatra. So over 50% of these creatures have declined in just the past 30 years. So in the process, OIC has had to task itself with rescuing more than 120 orangutans in just five years. Some orangutans, like Mikar here, become trapped in palm oil plantations when they reach the forest's edge. Palm oil workers are often encouraged to shoot and kill these pests for reward. And so when we got the call about Mikar, we rushed to her aid so that we could have the chance of saving her. And when we got there, the vet prepared a tranquilizer and prepared to shoot her from the ground, about 15 meters uh, from the tree. And then when she was tranked, finally we waited for the drug to take effect and waited on the ground. When the drug took hold, we waited with a net stretched between the hands of the villagers and the OIC team. And when she finally got to the ground, the vet took a good look at her body and found that she was riddled with bullets all over her body and her face. Thankfully, they were healed over and she was healthy enough to be translocated back to the National Park that day, but her life was only spared because she got, we got that call and that OAC had those connections in that village. Little baby Che Che here and other orangutans like her are so cute that people just want to have them as pets or status symbols. And so we found Che Che in an amusement park where she was being kept illegally in a tiny, dirty cage. We rescued her, and on the way to quarantine, she was so well-behaved that Penute held her in his lap instead of tranquilizing her. But these sweet orangutan baby smiles, they have some dark realities behind them. You see, mother orangutans and their babies have a strong, strong relationship. Mama, mama orangutan holds baby in her stomach for nine months, just like a human baby. And when she's born, baby spends the first few years of her life with mom, often sticking around until she's seven or 11 years old. And so to get a baby orangutan, you first have to kill its mother. Panut once told me a story about a poacher who had been out trying to find babies to sell, and so when he came across a mother who had a baby clutched to her chest, he shot it and it fell to the ground. But when it fell and he neared closer, he realized that the mother wasn't exactly dead. She was holding her baby close to her chest and kissing it over and over again on its forehead. And in that moment, he was struck with the knowledge of what he'd done all these years, and he turned and left, leaving the baby with her dead mother. He never shot another orangutan again. And on the heels of that story, I'd like to introduce you to someone named Mina. Now, Mina is someone, if you ever go to Sumatra, that is known for being terrifying and aggressive. And before I'd met her, I had heard every story in the book. She'd bitten more than 100 people and was in the Guinness World Book of Records. Nobody dared venture into what had become known as Mina's place. So when I met Mina, I was pretty much expecting a monster. But when I met Mina, I met someone who was utterly different than what I expected. Mina is a loving mother to her baby, Mansoor. She's also the mother of an older orangutan named Katrin, who still hangs around being eight or nine years old and plays big sister to her little brother. The more I found out about Mina, the more I realized that she was not what I had been told she was. And in fact, the more I grew to know about her, the more I realized we had a lot in common. It turns out that she had actually also been rescued as a baby once upon a time and that she had been found in a house being kept as a pet. So that means that she had been ripped away from the arms of her dead mother and placed in a cage for the enjoyment of others. So when she was finally rescued, rehabilitated, and released years later, they released her in a place called Bukit Lawang. 
Now, Bukit Lawang is a place where tourists often go in order to see orangutans in the wild. And so, to guarantee sightings for tourists, they used to have a feeding station where they would feed orangutans a couple times a day. And it was this feeding station that caused Mina to be conditioned to beg for food from tourists and local guides. Tragedy struck in 1996 when she asked a tourist for food, and when he didn't have any, she approached him aggressively. And so a guide slashed her in the face with a machete, leaving this scar as a reminder. Since then, she's been hit with machetes over 10 times. She's in a lot of pain. And when I see Mina, I see beyond that fearless exterior to that traumatized baby girl. Having your body invaded, feeling fearful and traumatized and frustrated and angry are things that I could understand. So in those, in those moments, I felt a sisterhood with Mina. I felt a connection that grew deeper and deeper as my journey went on. And most of all, I saw a mother, not a monster. Orangutans need the forest to survive, but so do we humans. Conservation is crucial. And one of the things Penny once told me is that people are part of the problem, but we're also part of the solution. And that's one of the things I absolutely admire about OIC. Because they understand that local people, when you connect with local people, you can get a lot done. OIC is not only run by local people, but they also include local people in every stage of their decision-making and implementation of their projects. And where other conservation efforts have failed due to paternalistic, top-down efforts, they have succeeded. I'd like you to meet a man named Baron. Baron works, used to work as a logger in a village called Haliban. But years ago, a palm oil company illegally took over part of the national forest that was part of their village. And it was noticeable that the water shortages were beginning to affect the local people because these people rely on water for everything, for drinking, cooking, cleaning. And palm oil plants, they suck up tens of gallons of water every day. And so when they noticed this was happening and had to start buying bottled water, OIC got involved, and together the villagers and OIC fought back against these plantations. And they ended up reclaiming the land legally. So Baran is no longer a logger. He is now working as a person who is restoring the palm oil plantation back to a forest. To date, OIC has reclaimed more than 1,000 hectares of illegal palm oil plantation. I was lucky a few months ago to actually witness the reclamation of 75 hectares of land. It was phenomenal, and I have never been so happy to see so many palm oil trees cut down. Now, that's not all, because, Pen uh, because OIC now has to get to work with restoring all 1,000 hectares that they've reclaimed, and they're almost halfway done. This was something that was once thought to be impossible, but OIC is proving everyone wrong as they convert palm oil plantations back into forests. So this is how it might look after a palm oil plantation has been cut down and the grass has taken over. And these grasses are very difficult to manage, but somehow OIC manages. And the next step, we'll make some planting lines and then plant a mixture of fast and slow-growing species that are endemic to Indonesia. Soon before you know it, the pollinators, the birds, the bees, and the butterflies are getting together and helping with the process of pollination and growing the forest. This is the new forest next to what it used to be, a palm oil plantation. And this is only after three to five years of growing. And this is the new forest next to the old growth forest. This is the same restoration site photographed from two different angles. It's phenomenal. And wouldn't you know it that before long, there were animals coming back. We have birds, monkeys, elephants, and of course, orangutans. And so all of this magic and wonder reminded me of the movie Fern Gully and this quote. That for just as every seed holds the magic and power of creation, so too do you and every other creature in this world. And while that sound, might sound mystical and unscientific, many studies are showing that we are closer to nature and each other than we once thought. A study by the University of Illinois found that when comparing public housing units that had trees and those that didn't, they found that the ones that had trees, people were more likely to feel a sense of connection, a sense of unity and belonging. 
They felt like there was less crime in their neighborhoods. And they also felt like they were able to overcome life's challenges. Pretty phenomenal things. And other studies, numerous studies show that just being in nature or viewing scenes of nature can cause us to reduce our anxiety, our fear, aggression, blood pressure, muscle tension, all kinds of things. And so it's pretty amazing how connected we are. And in Indonesia, it's customary to touch your heart after you have shaken someone's hand and met them. So I've been touched by everyone I've met in Indonesia and beyond words, beyond what I can explain. And so it's this sense of connection, this sense of restoration that has caused me to feel more determined than ever to act. They've not only rescued orangutans, reclaimed forests and restored them, but they've also rescued me. They've helped me reclaim my sense of humanity and also restored a sense of connection I had in the world that I didn't even know I had lost. Now I have become so involved and so enamored by this project that I've partnered with OIC to create something called the Sumatran Wildlife Sanctuary. This is a place that's going to be a conservation area spanning 50 hectares, and it'll also include a primate rescue center. Now, when I first heard this concept from Penut, uh, the fears and the doubts were going around in my mind, and I thought, oh my goodness, can I really do this? But the new me, the new restored me was saying, why not? Why not try? And you know what? Since then, and that's only about a couple years ago, we've already bought five hectares, and we're well on our way to buying the rest. But are these small efforts enough? Have we gone too far in destroying the planet and ourselves? Is it even worth trying? Well, when I look back on the day of that hearing, it felt like the worst day of my life. But in retrospect, it was actually one of the best. Where the pain had left a deep crevice, empathy had a deeper reservoir to take over so I could care more about the people on the planet. And in case you're wondering, I ended up winning my case. And it was the best day of my life. I have never felt more joyful, more alive, more connected. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if we win or lose. It just matters that we try. And so together, let's plant some seeds and make them grow. Thank you. <laughs>